Bertie, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate taking time out of your hectic schedule. Um, I know it's, a, it's an interesting time that we're all going through right now. Um, but yeah, really appreciate it. Um, how about for those of you that maybe haven't heard of you, or I don't know which rock they've been hiding under, but um, for those people, maybe you just give us a quick uh, introduction to, to yourself. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity, Chris. Uh, like I told you, it's a great honor for me. Uh, I really don't like talking about myself. You know, uh, Jimi Hendrix said it best, I don't accept compliments, compliments well because they make me complacent. So I kind of avoid all that stuff. Uh, this is my 40th year being involved in a profession of uh, physical preparation. I started in 1980 under head coach Jackie Sherrill, had the vision and the honestly the balls to hire me without administration's approval to run a strength and conditioning program at the University of Pittsburgh, where I stayed for my first 10 years. Uh, I left after 10 years. My oldest daughter, Kara, was diagnosed with autoimmune chronic active hepatitis, which is a progressive liver disease. Uh, in fact, I missed, she sent me a picture last week of me sleeping in Cleveland Clinic, which is where I spent my vacation last year, as they had to remove her gallbladder. She had some issues. By the grace of God, she's doing fine and stable, back home working. So I left for seven years, worked for a hospital in a PT clinic, which is where I really began, began to understand the value of physical therapy, uh, functional anatomy, and understanding how muscles and joints work and function. Uh, when I went back to Pitt in 97, <clears throat> started going to cadaver labs, met a guy named Louis Simmons, who was my first epiphany. Uh, and somehow we convinced Louis to come to the University of Pittsburgh. You know, Louis is a creature of habit, as am I. Uh, so I was surprised that he came and for four hours, he ripped me a new asshole <laughs> and I'll never forget as they were leaving and I paid for lunch too. I took him a lunch and paid for it. Uh, as we were, they were leaving, Dave take grabbed me by the arm and says, don't worry. He likes you. <laughs> Weeks later, myself and Tommy Myslinski, who's now the head strength coach of Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, drove the West side barbell and my world opened up. Uh, I think to truly understand somebody's methodologies, programming, you need to understand where they come from. So I asked Louis, I said, Louis, I said, I need all the articles you ever wrote for Powerlifting USA. So he sent me a little binder that still sits on my desk today, Chris, of all the articles he's ever written. I've read them over and over again. I don't think anybody truly understands strength until you've gone to Westside and watched those guys train. I have the utmost respect. I remember it was to get out of the car one morning and this massive human being gets out of a truck next to me and I'm talking massive and I'm like holy shit there's Chuck Vogelpool here's what really impressed me he knew who the fuck I was wow so, <laughs> there you go I was like he actually knows me I know who he is why does he know who I am so we go in the weight room into the Louis uh in the west side and um I watch him squat a thousand pounds I think four or five chains on each side so a high density foam pad. Uh, I've been in the old West Side Barbell on Demeros Road. It's it's funny. The old West Side Barbell where Tommy and I first went is literally two miles from a house that I grew up in in Columbus, Ohio. Wow. So which even one day I said, Tommy, <clears throat> make it right here. We went up Briggs Road. I said, I used to live in that house right there. And you know, I, I, I I've stayed with Louie uh, at his house. And he's the first one who got me to read Science of Practice of Strength Training by Zatorsky. I wound up visiting Zatorsky three times. He was at Penn State. I could never understand, here's this brilliant mind at Penn State, and nobody's ever walked into his facility or his room and asked him a question. And it was the first time I ever heard about force plate testing. Now, we have, uh, obviously, we use force plate a great deal. I spent a lot of time looking at Matt Jordan stuff and talking to Ryan Flaherty about the value of force plate testing with our athletes. Uh, in 2001, I got a call from Butch Davis, went to the Cleveland Browns. Uh, that lasted to 2004, sat around for about six months unemployed. I'm sorry, a year and six months. Uh, again, just a bad time, a dark time, because nobody wants to be unemployed. Uh, and I get a call from Turner Gill, went to the University of Buffalo for six months. Uh, met my wife, current wife there. They always tell people I took the best thing I bought for out of Buffalo and got the hell out. <laughs> Came back to the University of Pittsburgh. I brought James Smith in with me. And the one thing I've always tried to do is always hire assistants that are smarter than me. I don't want a bunch of mini-me's running around regurgitating everything I say. 
Uh, that's an egotistical strength coach. I want somebody that's going to come in and challenge me, ask me questions, say, I think I have a better way of doing that. And I've had that, you know, with Milo. I've had it with Anthony Paroli. I've had it with Peter Losey. I've had it with uh, Vern Stevens. I have it with Mark uh, Naylor. Now I have it with uh, Evan Lauder, who does our GPS. Uh, Jamie Hepner has been invaluable to me at Catapult. And he's a uh, coach TNA uh, over at Altus, as in Dan Path. And when I'm after I met, and when I went back up real quick, when I met Louis, two months later, I met, I got to start speaking with Charlie Francis. So I stayed in Buffalo for six months, came back to Pitt again. I, get, I brought James Smith. So I think James Smith is one of the most intelligent human beings I've ever been around in my entire life. And you have to understand James's background is classical music. Uh, he kind of knows I have two weaknesses. One is learning to play the guitar. So he comes in one day and just starts strumming uh, Stairway to Heaven on a guitar. And I was total shock. I'm like, where the fuck did we learn to do that? Uh, and then he knows the taser scene from, um, oh, what is it? Anyway, I forget the name of the movie. The Hangover. I cannot, okay, yeah. I'm just totally losing it. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I can't, I can't even watch it. Uh, I just start to lose it. And uh, spent many hours just talking, training with James. Unfortunately, we got let go by a very egotistical and arrogant athletic director named Steve Peterson. Which, thank God he's no longer there. Um, sat around for two years collecting a paycheck because I was on a, a new three-year deal that Coach once that had got me because I was going to go to the Washington Redskins and Mike Shanahan. <clears throat> uh, I was recently remarried, you know, a new stepson. My daughter was in nursing school and getting tuition waivers, so I stayed at Pitt. Uh, couldn't find, believe it or not, you know, well, I'm not going to say believe it or not, it just happened. Couldn't find a fucking job. So we moved back to Buffalo. My wife's hometown opened a performance center. I get a call from BA. Well, I actually text David Walker, who's running back coach of the Indianapolis Colts. I say, hey, David, just put my name in front of BA if he gets a chance. I knew he was interviewing for some pro jobs. I get text back the very next day from BA. If I'm in, you're in. So he gets hired. Last job open, Arizona Cardinals. My wife and I are celebrating. Calls me on the phone the next day. He says, it's the hardest phone call I've ever had to make in my life. I can't bring you in yet. So I went into a, a funk, started eating well butrin like it was M&M's. Uh, <clears throat> went back to University of Buffalo for six weeks, sitting in a parking lot one day. And I'm thinking about pulling a trigger on the gun. And coming home the night before, I get a phone call. It says, Bruce Arian. I get home and tell my wife, I think, eh, I think B.A. butt dialed me. And I'm a text. I said, you must have butt dialed at me. He goes, no, I want to talk to you. First thought in my mind was he just wants to talk to me and ask me about Caleb Mack, who became a first-round draft choice for the Oakland Raiders, now Chicago Bears. And I didn't have a chance to coach him. He was gone. So I'm sitting outside after lunch at the University of Buffalo, and <clears throat> it's like eight degrees out. There's four feet of snow. It's cold, miserable. And I get a phone call from B.A., and he goes, what are you doing? And I'll never forget, Tom, I'm freezing my fucking balls off. What are you doing? And he goes, I need you out here. He said, be on a plane, you'll interview. And that was it. I've been here and I haven't left since. I love living in Arizona. Uh, I work for a class family and a class guy named Michael Bidwell. He and Steve Kime, our GM, have been nothing but good to me. Uh, this year I had the opportunity to leave to go back to the University of Pittsburgh, and I love Pitt with all my heart. I've graduated from Pitt. I'm proud to be born and raised in that city. Because the first thing, you know, when Larry, when I got here, Larry used to tell me, you know, the first thing you say about Pittsburgh, blue collar work ethic, and I'm proud of that work ethic. Uh, I named it an unbelievable offer, and I text Steve Kime, our GM, on a Sunday morning, and hear anything back. So I said Monday morning I got to work. I said I go up and see Coach Kingsbury. So I went up to Coach, and I opened the door. Shook his hand. He goes, I'm already well aware. We're going to do everything we can to keep you. I don't want you to leave. I love your attention to detail. I want you here. And sometimes, Chris, that's all we need to hear. Uh, I love working for the guy. Uh, I, I love what the attitude he's brought to the organization. I love the coaches. I love my players. Uh, and the big thing is I love living in Arizona. It, I, I came here in 2001, Insight.com Bowl. I made the comment at that time, boy, I love living in Arizona. I guess you got to be careful what you say every once in a while, but now I'm living in Arizona. You know, my wife and I bought a beautiful home. 
I'm not happy that we brought out the lady who died in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've redone a lot of it. New flooring, new lights. I've never in my life, I was a poor kid that was raised in a library PA uh, by my mother who raised five of us because my parents were divorced. My dad, being a drunken womanizer, declared bankruptcy. I never in my life thought I'd have a pool. I have a pool in my backyard. Uh, and it's just a great place. It's a great time to be part of the Arizona Cardinal organization. And uh, so I decided to stay. And yeah, they gave me more money. But I think at some point in time in your life, uh, I, I just want to be happy. And I'm happy. Uh, you know, my wife is a tennis fanatic. She's retired from teaching. She doesn't have to look at me and say, oh, what am I going to do today? Because it's going to rain. Or it's going to snow. Or it's gray out. It's cloudy. It's horrible. Every day, it's, you know, she says, it, fuck, it's going to be 100 degrees today. I got to go out and play tennis by 6 a.m. <laughs> I mean, it's... Hey, it's a, it's a great place. I was actually lucky enough to take some vacation down there in the summer. I was in Scottsdale, I think it was. Um, and yeah, we, we actually went and watched one of your practices, me and, me and the missus, went and watched one of your practices in the summer there. And I spent a little bit of time at Altus and it was great. Like, we fell in love with the place, the temperature and everything else. Like, it, it was fantastic. It's going to be 107 tomorrow. Don't care. I don't have to show the sunshine. <laughs> it's not gray, it's not cloudy, it's not raining. It's amazing what the sun can do for your your mood and your attitude. You got to see the sun every day. Now, don't get me wrong, we have a raining, raining season. It gets cold, cold here in February, and people say, how can you stand the heat? I'm like, you people back east, especially northeast, you get fucking four weeks of good weather, and you think it's God's gift. You know, oh, you're calling us on the phone. Oh, it's beautiful here today. I should call you every day and say the same thing to you. <laughs> hey, you should uh, you should come to the UK and see we get we get four days, never mind four weeks. <laughs> I've been there. We played we played there a couple years ago against the Rams, and I was standing on a practice field, and it's windy as hell, and I'm watching these massive airliners going to land, and they're being just knocked around in the wind. I'm like, how are they even landing those things? Most people don't even know how much they're getting bounced around. Yeah. So I guess, but you just um. One of the advantages of being here, anyway, so this is my third staff I've been on. It's my seventh year. Uh, Michael Bidwell and the Bidwell family and organization were kind enough to give me a new three-year deal. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I can sit on my ass and, you know, be comfortable. It just, to me, just means I got to find a way to work harder and harder. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of being in Arizona, obviously, is Altus, like you just mentioned. And uh, two weeks before I landed here, I got in touch with Frank Rizzo, who's the head uh, sprinter and hurdlers coach at Iowa State. And I said, Frank, give me a touch with Dan Pass. We did two weeks of landing in Arizona. I was at Altus. And the first day I went there, like I tell everybody, I didn't ask a question. I just watched the man coach. He's one of the greatest, the greatest problem solver and observationist I've ever seen in my life. And I've been fortunate in my career to have a great relationship with Dan and with the late Charlie Francis, who taught me so much. Uh, and Angela Kuhn is, is, is uh, surviving wife still reaches out to me on Facebook with messages. Unfortunately, I apologize to Angie. I, I just, I don't know how to do messenger. I'm very, I'm an idiot when it comes to social media and computers. That's why I'm surprised this works. This, <laughs> now I can't say enough about Stu McMillan, Jason Helter, Andreas Bame, and Chidi and AA, who I'm constantly bothering Chidi. I don't write an acceleration program until I send it to him and get his input. And explain to them what we're doing, why we're doing it. Uh, again, we're not elite sprinters or field sprint athletes. A couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to hear Dr. Ken Clark speak at the Professional Football Co Strength and Coaches Association at the Combine, and uh, you know, fell in love with his work. So, like I tell everybody, you know, one of the benefits being here is also you have to be a total idiot not to take advantage of. I even signed up for Altus's apprenticeship coaches program. I'm bringing. Uh, my wife's oldest son, who runs his own training facility in Buffalo, New York, Fred Duncan, very intelligent young man. Unfortunately, he's stuck in a shithole. <laughs> and he's extremely intelligent. He writes some great stuff. He's on the internet, and, you know, Instagram and all that other good stuff. Happy horseshit. Him and Gedango are two of my favorite young guys. <clears throat> but it, it's just a true blessing being out here and being able to talk to, talk to Dan, you know, and talk to these young guys. Uh, this place has a lot to offer, and I know people always ask me, how do you deal with it? It's a uh, personal terrorist 
uh, center of the world. I'm right, like, listen, all you've got to do is explain to your athletes what you're doing and why you're doing it. And they understand that you've got their care at heart and you're trying to make them better and they will do anything for you. And I've been fortunate to have players like that. I was very fortunate my first year here to have Carson Palmer and Drew Stanton. I was very fortunate to have Larry Fitzgerald, who's a future Hall of Famer, as I hope Carson Palmer is. And, uh, you know, Larry's a pit guy, so he looked after me. But I've had great guys who have bought in, and they've helped with the younger guys. And I think people see the results they get. They're not being trained into the ground. You know, I've always said there's eustress and distress. The eustress is a feeling of good. You should feel good when you're done training. You shouldn't walk out of the weight room dragging your tongue, laying in a pool of sweat, or vomiting and puking. That's just maladaptation to impose demand. That's me giving you something that you weren't ready for, Chris. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't take a genius to do. And uh, I've been fortunate to be here as long as I have. I've been fortunate to know the people I have, including Louis Simmons, uh, Boo Schneckschneider, and a, and a whole host of other great coaches, Ryan Flaherty and Nike, who have actually guided me and helped me uh, with programming. And anytime I have a question, to call and ask. So I've been very blessed, and I'm, I'm very fortunate, and I'm, I'm thankful that uh, you asked me to be here. I ha can't say enough about some of the PTs who have taught me. Uh, my best friend, one of my very closest friends my whole life is Michael Hope, who's a PT in Syracuse, New York. Brett Fisher is our PT here at the Arizona Cardinals, who I have had a great relationship with and known since the early 2000s. Uh, I've had James Smith, the most intelligent human being I've ever met in my life, to work with me at Pitt. I got a guy named Derek Samuels out in um, Palo Alto, I think I, there's somewhere outside of San Diego, California. These guys are always, all they gotta do is text me and answer questions, they get right back to me. So I see, see I bring him out. You mentioned obviously like all these phenomenal names and things like that and your, your willingness to just reach out to them and learn from everyone and anyone. Um, kind of on that, on that topic, do you see what's the value in, in having a, a mentor or things like that for some like strength and conditioning coaches today just coming out of university? Do you see there's obviously like great value in having a mentor or someone you can you can reach to um, to speak with and like pick their brains? I, you know, when I started this profession in 1980. And I'm sure 99% of your people who are listening weren't even born then. I didn't have a mentor. Here's who my mentors were. I had a great, great high school track coach named James Sanderbeck. I had a great jump and sprinters coach named Dom DiMattia, who introduced me to my metrics when I was 15 years of age. And here's what kills me about when I hear people say, well, you should squat two and a half times your body weight before you do plyos. I'm like, listen, motherfucker. I couldn't squat my way out of a wet paper bag when I was 15. Bounding up and down the field and sprinting. I was my, the old house my parents owned before my father left, he replaced the back deck. And the back deck, you know, was like four feet or five feet off the ground. And before the steps were in, my brothers used to, my eyes used to run off the deck and jump and land and then take off sprinting. Or we'd jump up onto the deck. I think play with kids, which kids don't do anymore, is highly plyometric in nature. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe in any of the nonsense that's being shoved down our throat by some of the governing bodies, organizations that we have to, you know, be certified by now. It's a, it's just, let me use sort of example. Ken Clark, Peter Way, and approved it. You want to run faster? To the, the, um, generate more mass specific force into the ground and prop biomechanical position, ever decreasing increments of time to run faster. Stride length and stride frequency are not the keys to running fast. Stop preaching that. They are byproducts or consequences of running fast. Don't mistake correlation for causation. Mm -hmm. Sprinters have a unique wind up and delivery phase. And I think nowadays with all the gurus out there, and you better be very careful when you use the word normal or norm normative. What's normal for you might not be normal for me. The same boat we know as Dan Papp is talking about scoliosis. You can find a way to work at it, make it work for him. He's the fastest man in the world. You're going to argue with him? Look at Michael Johnson, who held the former world record, 400 meters. He ran leaning backwards. Who's to say he's not right and wrong? Look at Michael Phelps. More Olympic gold medals than anybody in the world. Highly kyphotic. Highly kyphotic forward head posture. And I've talked to Keenan Robinson. I think he's an outstanding young strength coach. If those guys, those elite athletes, weren't doing what they were doing, every postural movement guru and PTs in this country have lost their mind over movement. Uh -huh. 
criticizing their movement, saying, well, he needs to correct his posture. He needs to correct his forward head lead. He needs to correct his chest body posture. He needs to correct this, this, and that. No, you don't. It's working for him. They found a way to make it work for them. I went to the – Jada Mayo has a great clinic in Western Virginia. Mm -hmm. Lesnoff spoke, and he was talking about – he was standing in the back of, a, of the audience, and there was a presenter, and he was showing some of Hank's sprinters. Hank produces some uh, – and Hank produced some great sprinters in the Netherlands. It's cold as hell up there. <clears throat> so he doesn't have the ideal conditions. Same with Charlie Francis. Charlie worked with major inner city poor kids. They didn't have starting blocks, but they had sports. But anyway, Hank said he was standing in the back, and the presenter said, this is how we want our starts to look. Hank raised his hand, and he goes, wait a minute. That worked for him. That might not work for you. Don't get me wrong. I think there's an optimal model in every but how many, are, how many of us are going to fit that optimal model? Like Dan Pass says, there's a bandwidth on either side. Strength and conditioning coaches, especially in college, are fanatics on hitting landmark positions and angles in the lifts. Why aren't you doing the sprint? I think that comes back to as well with like the best athletes are the best compensators at the end of the day. Listen, the best athletes are the best athletes because they're the best athletes. That's <laughs> what I'm not. Any shit you're doing that's making them better. Yep. When I started University of Pittsburgh in 1980, for three years, we went 11 and 1. In three years, we had 14 or 15 first-round drafts. You know what the hardest thing I did was? Open the door and turn the lights on. When you're getting the best of the best, Chris, it ain't that hard. Mm -hmm. So be cautious. And I'm talking every – I don't give a shit what anybody thinks of me now. Because at 63, like Oprah Winfrey said, you kind of get to the point in life where you don't care what you say because you know the end is near. <laughs> so <laughs> – so, um, it's easy to coach great athletes. Just don't screw them up. Uh -huh. It's not programming. And here's one of the real, there used to be an Olympic coach. I'm not going to name his name, but there were two major universities. I'm not going to name the universities. They were doing his program. And he was telling everybody they're successful because they do my program. Then they hit the skids and haven't been worth a shit in years. Crickets. So if you're going to brag about people doing your program and they're successful because of it, when a shit hits the fan and they ain't no good, you better be able to take credit for that too. The yeah. bottom line is, if you know, you can't predict anything. Uh, I think Martin Bissinger great wrote a great book called Training Talks. It's Dan is in there, uh, John Keeley's in there, uh, Dan Path is in there, Milo's in there. And the one thing, you know, they all for the one. I think John Keeley he talks about periodization. And I've always questioned periodization. To me, it's just a concept and a plan, and nothing ever goes according to plan. You got to be Plan B, be Plan B. Close to plan A as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy named Philip Tulloch did a, a study for the United States government. He looked at all the, the, the predictors and all these experts in multiple fields, economics, weather, uh, where we're going uh, in technology. And at the bottom line, at the end of the day, he said, making predictions is about as accurate as chimpanzees throwing darts. <laughs> there, there is no way. You can't predict anything. They can't predict the weather. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it's so unstable and unchanging. And think about this. Until you make an attempt to understand the multifactorial complex nature of the human body, how it responds to loading, and I think we've just begun to scratch the surface mm -hmm. of the human body's capabilities in, in, in performance. If you look at some of the research from, um, again, Peter Whalen and, and Dr. Ken Clark, they're talking about speed, single, single leg hopping, speed hopping on one leg, Compared to the force output of sprinting landing on one leg, single leg speed hop is one and a half to two times greater force production. Once the body figures that out, what's the same bolt run at 27.8 miles an hour, 12 meters a second? Mm -hmm. Yeah, human beings are going to run 30, 35 miles an hour. I won't be around, and it'll be a while because if you look over the years and years of 100 meters, it's been small incremental improvements, very small. But if you look at the 12 guys who are at the, on the, uh, the starting line, the finals of the Olympics, all 12 have gotten there by different routes. Yep. Dan Path always told me, look for the common denominator. There's a common denominator. They've all sprinted. Oh, there's a shocker. And most people are afraid to do true sprint work because they're afraid of pulled hamstring. But if you look at all the things that are being said, one of the best ways to influence the long head of the bicep femoris is actual max velocity. Mm -hmm. I said before, Maximal, max sprinting or sprinting will improve the entire acceleration profile. It uses, it makes use of motor units that aren't accessible by any other means. 
you'll produce more force vertically sprinting than you will in any other exercise in a weight room. As you and I talked prior to coming on, mm -hmm. you know, as loads go up in a weight room, velocity goes down. What are you going to do? Put a thousand pounds on your back and hop around a weight room on a single leg? I'll, I'll <laughs> wait to try and do that on Instagram. <laughs> but um, and in the very beginning, I won't deny the fact that strength will make you faster because you're producing more force. But as you get older, shoot. Strength is just a component of supportive quality of speed and power development. Telling athletes that if you squat more and hang clean more, you'll run faster is a straight lie. Because I think at some point in time, unless you're a power lifter, unless you're an Olympic lifter, unless you're a bodybuilder or strength athlete, chasing maximal strength isn't worth it. It's not worth the cost benefit analysis. I think there's people don't understand there's multiple ways and athletes get stronger via multiple methods. Athletes manifest force beyond the barbell so in this entire epidemic hit everybody's like oh what are we going to do we can't lift weights i should stop and i and i anthony proley and i talked about this i should stop thinking about exercises start thinking about objectives and procedures what's the greatest force producer in the world sprinting mm -hmm. climb jump go have your athlete sprint if you're not comfortable in sprinting on flat ground have a flat ground have sprint up hills like charlie talked about do speed work. That's the greatest force for better. Weights will drive up. I mean, sprinting will drive up weights before weights drive up sprinting. And I think that's a common secret, dirty little secret amongst college strength coaches. You hit all these landmark positions, but don't get me wrong. You look at all the uh, the great sprinters on that 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 start line for the finals Olympics. They all hit the landmark positions, the angles, and the force vectors pretty much identical. But they've all gotten their different means. Well, you want to coach those angles and you want to coach all these landmark positions in the clean or the squat, and I'll talk about those the squat in a second here, <clears throat> but you don't want to do it in speed training because you're afraid. You're afraid to coach speed. Do you, think, do you think that's an issue within college saying, oh, well, with a lot of coaches saying, look, we're, we're, we're the strength coach. Like, we're, we're comfortable in the weight room, and, and that kind of transfers almost – if we if they do do speed development, it, we're looking for hard and fast answers in terms of specific shapes, and trying to almost force square pegs in round holes. And you can't do that. Yeah. You know, speed. If you ask any athlete, you know, the five S's: skill, speed, strength, stamina, supplements. What motor ability they desire the most is going to be speed. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to run fast. That's what separates the elite from the good, and the good from the average, or the great from the good. The good from the average, and the average stays the average. Everybody wants to run fast. I was fortunate enough uh, in high school. I went to college on a track scholarship. Now, I know most people aren't going to believe this, but you can ask Larry Fitzgerald, you can ask Roger Kingdon, you can ask anybody I ran track at the University of Pittsburgh. I ran, my best time was over 10, 400 meters back in 77, 78. I was a short, stocky, strong sprinter. I was not lean and elastic. I was not fast to bat, fast to bait. You do, as my progress, you know, got away from sprinting and got away from track and field, which I think is one of the greatest sports in the world. You want to see if a, a program truly works, coach a track and field athlete. Uh -huh. You can't look at a program for a football team and say, what I'm doing works. Because there's too many abilities, and those, there's too many hierarchy of abilities that are specific to each position. You're not going to train a DB like you train a line. They don't have the same requirements. And to do so, in my opinion, is ludicrous. To make a 300-pound offensive lineman run a 300-yard shuttle is death. That's not a thought process. And I think that's a huge mistake. But again, that's my opinion. I really don't care if you share it or not, because I'm at the end, uh, hopefully not at the end of my career. I told Michael Bidwell I'm good to 70. Like, <laughs> and people are going to have to put up with my bullshit for another seven years. But just like, you know, people say, oh, you got to add another plate to the bar. Yeah, if you want to get stronger. But getting stronger isn't always the answer. Mm -hmm. And listen. When we line up on the field, they're not going to put a bench, squat rack, and platform at a 50-yard line, are they? So a squat is a great exercise. Guess what? The majority of my skill guys prefer not to do it, so we don't do it. They do trap bar pull based on Ryan Flaherty's research. Just same thing. If it strengthens the arms, the extensors of the arm, in a scapular plane, who gives a shit what you do? Bench press, dumbbell bench, weighted push-ups, loaded push-ups, cable pressing, machine pressing, who cares? So who cares if I squat, rear foot elevate switch, split squat, goblet squat, front squat, back squat, belt squat, searcher squat, use different variations of bars. Who cares if I do a trap bar pull, 
they're all just strengthening those tissues which will be displayed through the physical qualities of the skill on the field. The brain, the brain doesn't know the difference between like a hex bar and, and a straight regular barbell, you know? Yeah, most people don't. Yeah. Well, don't buy, like I said, don't think exercise. Don't think there's one all to be all exercise. Because there's not. And you're going to have responders and non-responders. So you're going to have to find what your non-responders respond to, which is where the force play comes into play and just watching people train. That's why I say, I don't like being at home. I'd rather be on the floor working because then I know what works. I see it's working. I've had Chandler Jones now for, I think, five, four or five years. I've asked my wife, but I know it works for Chandler Jones. I know it works for Corey Peters. Uh, I know what, what, what works for Pat Peterson. I know it works for Larry Fitzgerald. I, I know it works for uh, Mason Cole now. I've only had him for Mason for two years, but I know it works for him. I'm starting to figure out. I know it works for the, the rookies we had last year. Eventually, you'll figure out what works for everybody. So you can't write cookie-cutter programs, especially on this level, because you're dealing with athletes who are 22 to 42. And you're not going to give an old guy the volume to give a young guy. And you're not going to have an old guy chase maximum effort strength because, like I said, cost-benefit analysis. And there's multiple other ways you can get them stronger beyond the weight room, and they can best force beyond the weight room. By finding those, by finding those other ways, what are you, what are you using? Is are you obviously communicating with the athlete, saying, "Oh, Larry, look, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, you know your body better than me. What do you feel that works? Is that the conversation that you're having? Hey, believe it or not, nine times out of ten, yeah. Yeah. I'll have linemen come to me and say, "Listen, buddy, I don't feel like bench pressing today. My shoulders and elbows are beat up. I don't care. I'm like, okay, we'll dumbbell bench." And look, think about this. When you think about an exercise, just don't think about the exercise. Think of the multiple methods you can use for exercise. Eccentrics, so I run a block of eccentrics for two weeks. I run a block of ISO for two weeks. I run a block of regular dynamic effort bench with just a regular two-handed dumbbell bench. That's six weeks. Now I go to alternating dumbbell bench. I use those same three methods. That's six weeks. Now I go to single arm dumbbell bench. I use those, that's nine weeks. And then I go back to doing some, the one and a half benches or ISO yielding or ISO overcoming. I can run a dumbbell bench cycle for 20 some weeks without having to actually return to a regular dumbbell bench. It's still a dumbbell bench, but the methodology that's being employed at the time of year that's correct is being emphasized. I've used, uh, I hired Mike, Mark Naylor, who was, uh, came from a good friend of mine, Aaron Wellman, highly recommended. And I love Aaron. And uh, James Betcher was our defensive coordinator when I was my first couple of years in Arizona. He, he was just briefing with the Giants. But I said, we're going to do dynamic effort bench day with dumbbells. He goes, dumbbells? I'm like, yeah. Dynamic effort does not have to be a barbell. Mm -hmm. Dynamic effort can be anything you move fast. I could use med ball throws for dynamic effort. Uh, Louis once told me to use heavy med ball for max effort. You can push a car for max effort work. So you have to think outside of exercise. Mm -hmm. I have the optimal, optimal respect for Louis, as I do for Charlie and as I do for Dan Pat. But I have to look at their sports and make them applicable to my sport of field-based athletes. My guys aren't going to run 100 yards down the field, Chris, with blinders on, in a lane, unobstructed, without a ball in their hand, chasing somebody with their head on a swivel looking for somebody to ear hold them. We are in a chaotic environment. So if you look at what Charlie and uh, a guy named Ralph Mann once said, his book on hurling and sprint technique is, is great. You're only going to achieve about 84% of max velocity on the field. And again, think about it again. When we played the Green Bay Packers a couple years ago in the NFC, and going into the NFC, before we went to the NFC Championship game against the Carolina Panthers, and over time, Larry caught a pass from Garson Palma on the far left sideline. By the time he was tackled, he was on the far outside of the right half. He made like 14 different cuts. Do you think he achieved max velocity? <laughs> and Absolutely if not. Civil, looking and avoiding people, he was stiff on me. So optimal mechanics wasn't there. Optimal environment wasn't there. But you have to be able to teach them how to accelerate from multiple different positions. There's some plyos I love for skill guys. I won't do with my big guy. I love hurdle bonds for my skill guy. I don't love them for my big guy. Mm -hmm. I think last week we counted the different variations of box jumps we did. There was over 20-some variations of different box jumps. And I love box jumping because it teaches you to produce force in the ground, teaches you to land by bringing the ground up. I think it's a basic rudimentary skill that everybody should do. You can't jump. How can you be an athlete? Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of times it's just, you know, take into account, listen, we all have to account for the daily uncertainty of training readiness. 
I've done HRV before. Joel James, I, I know very well. I think wrote one of the best books on energy systems. He gave me BioForce. I'm, I, I, when I say I'm old school, I still have that mentality for me, in other words, that I got to go in and go heavy every day, balls to the wall. You know, that's just the body bending that's really mentality. Now, I've become a little smarter. I go in and say, okay, I'm give myself an hour, and that's it, I'm out. Uh-huh. And I always tell my wife I'm ready to leave. I still got one more set to do. I'm famous for that. So my bio force one day came up red. And I'm like, nah, fuck it. I'm going to go train anyway. <laughs> train. Some people drink. Some people eat. Some people do drugs. I got to go to the gym. I don't give a shit how. One of the C's I'm in the gym every day. I know I'm not supposed to, and I know I feel like shit half the time, but I'm a stress trainer. So uh, I go to the gym, and I set a PR on the old hammer leg press. Four days later, I get a green. I go back. I go legs again. I blow an adductor. How'd that happen? Here's what people forget about. When you train, you have to take into account acute, immediate, cumulative, delayed, and residual effects of training. It was just a residual effect of what I wasn't supposed to do four days ago. It displayed itself four days ago. So I always look at people, when I talk to people about injury, there's one factor that's common in all injuries. It's fatigue. I don't care who you are, some degree of fatigue will enter in. And people say, well, I did at the beginning of practice. What were you doing the last three days? What was your fatigue level? How did it accumulate? How did it build up over the last three days? What were your sleep habits? You know, we are gimmick oriented, never seen before, double pre- probation, top secret, latest, greatest society. We love gaz- gadgets and gizmos. We love anything that we think is going to be a quick fix. Winston Churchill always said it best. I'll, I may have my kids and my wife put this on my tombstone. Americans will always do it right after they've tried everything else. That's what we do. We look for a quick fix and everything from diet and nutrition to training to weight loss to getting bigger and stronger. And um, what was I just talking about? Well, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct you into something here as well, which I know I think you've got a, obviously a passion for and then speaking with, with Joel Jameson a lot as well is. Oh, that's right. I was just talking about Joel and getting injured. Yeah. But yeah, we're, we're a quick, quick fix society. We look for gadgets and gizmos. So. We forget about one thing, Chris. I don't mean to interrupt you. The simplest things have the most profound influence on the human body. Mm-hmm. The basics are the basics for a reason, because they work. Yeah. Three things that will never leave, lose their effectiveness, and they're essential to life, but are not sexy to the American public. You're never going to go on Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, or Facebook and see this talked about. Nobody's going to – I'm going to post it one day and say, I had the fucking best workout of my life. I had nine hours of sleep. I ate like a champ. I was well hydrated. You'll never see that. Instead, you'll see – the latest cu- I love when players walk in in the off season and they got cupping marks all over. I'm like, what are you getting cupping for? There's nothing fucking wrong with you. I recover. I'm like, how about here's recovery? Get a good night's sleep. Make sure you're hydrated, eat well, and let the body do its job. The inflammation, the hormonal changes, the metabolic stress, and the enzymatic disruptions are all part of the adaptation process. When's the body going to do its job? I tell my guys, you only need recovery method three times a year. One during a block of recovery. So after we go through mandatory mini camp, you know, it's four days of intensive work, practice two times a day. We go into a one-week block of recovery. Everything is more aerobic-based. Training in a weight room is cut down to three days. <clears throat> and they do those recovery method off, method, those different types of recovery methods that they, they think works for them or they enjoy. Then we go to, to restore balance between, between balance of the autonomic system. We all know there should be a balance between uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic branch beyond the nervous system. And last but not least, during the season. Law of accommodation. You expose the tissue or the body to the same stimulus over and over and over again. Over time, that stimulus is going to lose its effectiveness, just like training. Everything in life loses its effectiveness over time, except for those three essentials. But nobody wants to talk about that. That's, that's too simple. That's just too simple. It's got to be more complex and complex. Sometimes the, sim- the best answers for complex problem problems are very simple in their application. But we want to make it so much harder. People are shocked when they see how basic my program is I run. Oh, you're doing, oh, you're sprinting? Yeah. You're doing tempo work? I'm like, yeah. There's also positional tempo because the aerobic system must mimic 
or reflect the function of the muscle in the competitive exercise because the anaerobic threshold will reflect the oxidative potential on the muscle involved in the work. So there is a place, and we just introduced that uh, this week with position-specific tempo work. We're doing uh, under five seconds of work, under five or six seconds, sub-maximal pace with short intervals. All you're doing is developing aerobic system, which is highly important for power speed athletes. Charlie talked about separating high-low intensity so that you can, number one, secure the adaptation of the high CNS work, and number two, you just can't train two days back-to-back -back high CNS work. Especially taking that alactic aerobic model that I think you're kind of hinting on there. How are you adapting that obviously and using it from your kind of your skill guys to your linemen? Like what's your aerobic stuff looking like? What's the difference there? I don't always require my big guys to run because it's hard on their legs. Mm -hmm. So what I will do is give them options, med ball circuits, body weight circuits with bands, uh, rope work, versa climber, closed chain work. Something to give their legs a break. My skill guys, because that's all they do is run, is we'll do, I don't make, the only difference I make between intensive and extensive tempo is just the rest interval. I know James used to use uh, intensive tempo with our guys at Pitt where they were running 112, 13 seconds, then switch to extensive tempo, they'd be 14 to 16 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I do do for everybody, Chris, is nobody, Nobody comes in on a Monday and does speed work, especially after a day off. There's, uh, there's too much a reason because a day off renders a situation in where uh, the muscular tone is reduced drastically. And I think there's an optimal tone that has to be maintained. And I'm talking about passive partial contraction of the tissue. Obviously, there's too low of tone. Um, you're going to be more prone to um, injury. I think the biggest mistake the NFL makes is we train Monday to Thursday and then give them Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. Right. So when you disrupt the adaptation of, I mean, you disrupt the rhythm of stress and adaptation, stress and adaptation, the body dives deeper down into the rabbit hole of recovery. And it all depends on the individual, how fast you can reboot that. And that, again, is specific to the individual. Just like daily uncertainty of training readiness is specific to the individual. You know, Dan Papp said it best. Your athlete's got to meet you 50-50. We have them for two hours a day. What are they doing the other 22 hours? If you're not sleeping, if you're going out to strip clubs because all of a sudden you've got all this money, you're partying your brains out, and you're not hydrating properly. <clears throat> I, I, I challenge anybody to take one week, eat like shit, sleep like shit, and hydrate like shit, and try and train. Because I don't care how much pre-workout you take, I think it's going to catch up to you, and you're going to hit a downward spiral, and you're not going to get any better. I think there are certain things that are inherently built into our system, and those three essentials of life aren't going to change. Just like right now, you know, everybody is dealing with a period of time of uncertainty, and periods of time of uncertainty will create great anxiety, which creates tension. Tension anywhere is tension everywhere. I think, you know, it's hardwired into every player, every strength coach, every GM, every owner, every athletic director, every head football coach, this time of the year especially for the sport of American football, you're either in spring ball or OTAs. Your system expects that. And I always said the body is a system of systems with its own checks and balances, and no system works independent of the other system. So right now, everybody's hardwired to be doing this, doing practice, to be training, and now all of a sudden it's taken away. That disrupts those systems, those systems. That throws a monkey wrench into them. So think about how people are trying to deal with us, this uncertainty of not knowing the time frame, not being able to train in an environment that's conducive to getting better. So now the athlete has to meet us 90 10. The athlete is responsible for their preparation. There, there's no reason in my mind not to show up in great shape. I don't want to say great shape, I hate that word shape, with a high level, with a high fitness level. And when I say fitness level, I mean, there's bioenergetic demands in place, alactic power to capacity, aerobic power to capacity, and the ability to withstand, withstand a significant task. When guys call me and say, or text me and say, what's a conditioning test? And I'm like, why? Well, I want to do it. I'm like, waste your time. Here, let me give you some advice. Do the fucking running program that I have assigned with tempo work, alactic power to capacity work, 
and I don't care what I ask you to run, you'll pass it. It's that simple. If energy systems are put in place and they're reinforced, I don't care what test we give them, they're going to pass it. And how do you deal with, so you mentioned that obviously the body being a system of systems. So if you're going into, say you maybe didn't make the, the playoffs or, or something like that, and the, the season's all of a sudden being cut short, the, the body's still on potentially high alert, like you've said there, it's still expecting to go for maybe another fr a few weeks, because that's what you've been practicing for the whole season. How are you dealing with that transition period for your athletes? Is that just the end of the season and that's it, shut off, done? Or are you giving yeah, them yeah. something to help them tra to transition? I'm glad you asked. I actually have a transition period. Okay. And I called my one day. I said, Tommy, I got this great idea. He goes, that's fantastic. They ain't going to do it. And he's right. Some of them have done it. And the guys that have done it have felt great. And have been able to be able to start training without any issues soon. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. For two weeks after the season, because like you just said, stopping anything abruptly is like running a car into a brick wall a thousand miles an hour. Did you ever watch a drug addict stop his drugs? and watch them go through DTs, your body is on high alert. It's, it's expecting to play. Then all of a sudden you just say, done. What do you think happens to those systems? So we do Charlie Francis bike tempo. I put together every other day bike tempo work with mobility, simple body weight exercises, and some simple strength work to transition into that time off period. And it runs for a little over two weeks. It's aerobic in nature, circulatory response, help promote recovery, help get blood circulating through the system, help them feel better. You'd be surprised, the guys, and I was shocked too, the guys who did it came to me and said, boy, I'm glad I did that, I feel 100% better. Because again, once you disrupt the body, the rhythm mm -hmm. of stress and adaptation, you disrupt what it's used to. Like I said, any drug addict, you take a drug away from an addict and you tell them to stop, there's gonna be serious issues. I don't care who you are. You've just got to slowly kind of almost taper them off it to a degree and wean it back. And I think that's the best way to do it. If I was in college, I'd do the same thing. We're not going to a bowl game. Here's what we're going to do for the next two weeks before you go home for Christmas. We're going to work around finals. I get it. Mm -hmm. Five minutes of your time, three days a week. Not a lot. Or you can right. come get yourself a yoga instructor. I'm going to have a yoga person come in. Just anything to promote blood flow or circulatory response to ease that transition instead of abruptly stopping. Yeah, but I put together a two-week program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on Charlie Francis bike tempo. And uh, guys have done a great result. Just, just for some of the listeners that maybe aren't familiar with Charlie Francis's um, his bike tempo protocol, do you mind just going into some of the details of that quickly? Uh, all it is is warming up on a bike and performing – basically running tempo intervals on the bike and it's first with mobility work or simple strength work. I say simple strength work. TRX, IY, T raises, face pull, inverted bows, bicep curls, tricep extension, push up, ab work, hurdle mobility. Uh, I do a, a eight position leg swing on the wall with our guys, which really opens up our hips. I learned a lying eight position, uh, really it's only seventh position. I've taken it to nine position from Ryan Flaherty to hammer the glute meat. But it's Simple mobility work, simple recovery work that can be done in your basement on a bike. There's, uh, you go to Charlie Francis' website, he still has it up. And I don't want to go into too much detail because it took me a while to put this thing together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's on there. I'm sure Angela, Angie Kuhn will answer the same question. But it's Charlie Francis' bike tempo. It's been all, all of his um, video series is there's something in there about bike tempo. It's just like people don't understand the high low approach. And Dan Path told me this my first guy here. He said, listen, if it's important, it needs to be done on a daily basis. So what we did is we dispersed our high CNS work throughout the week. What, I'm, what I mean by that is our low CNS days, we move med ball throws to it. We also do some brief accelerations. You can have an exposure to a high CNS component on a low CNS day as long as it's brief in nature. All you're doing is maintaining that stimulus or characteristic of the high CNS work. And that's all we do it every day, some type of high CNS. But again, the volume of work drops drastically on those low days. It's just put in place just to maintain. And there's multiple ways to do med ball throws, Chris. There's overcoming. You can take advantage of stretch shortening cycle. You can take advantage of eccentric loading. You can take eccentric uh, uh, ISO overcome by dynamic. You can do a rapid eccentric to ISO, then a dynamic throw. There's multiple ways to express or manifest output using med balls using, again, different methods.
I mean, think about it. It's our job to help our athletes achieve the highest level of physical preparation using methods and means. When I say means or exercises that yield the highest possible results at the lowest cost. The sport is a high cost. Yep. If you don't want to get injured, don't play the sport. It's that simple. I don't care who, nobody walks away from any career in any sport unscathed. Nobody. I look at how beat up Larry is sometimes. And I'm like, God bless you, Larry, because at 36, or I think 37, I used to do the same thing with Carson, Carson Palmer. I'm like, how the fuck are you still doing this? <laughs> the best thing I ever heard was when Jerome Bettis retired from the Steelers, they, they inducted him to the NFL Hall of Fame. He said, my body only had so many hits, and I had achieved those hits. You know, so those guys are so in tune to their system, they just know when it's time to step away. Mm -hmm. You talk about hamstring issues. Hamstring issues are not going away. I got news for everybody. I don't care what the internet says. We've bastardized the Nordic hamstring exercise, which to me is, is not the end all the be all hamstring exercise. It has a horrible eccentric component for 99% of the people. It targets the wrong tissue. Uh, it's it just like James Smith said, Charlie Francis said, it's just chicken soup. After the major stuff is done, everything else is just chicken soup. You want to strengthen the hamstrings? Yes, train them eccentrically. There's a tremendous eccentric component to it. Train them in a lengthened position because muscles that gain strength in a lengthened position are more resilient to pulls. But again, prepare yourself through quality speed, acceleration work, and tempo work. There's developing a great aerobic system will mitigate or blunt the effects of high or spikes in and chronic workload as everybody talks about. So I think, again, energy systems are in place. You're doing your recovery methods. You're eating well, you're sleeping well. Don't have me walk into your room at 11 o'clock at night for bed check and you're sitting there playing video games. Because all you're doing is becoming highly sympathetic dominant. You're not moving, but your brain's like, my wife's son, Troy, he and I used to play video games. I'd get about five minutes in, I'm like, fuck this, I got a headache. <laughs> Man, I can't even, I can't even figure out we have a smart TV and a fucking TV smarter than my wife and I. I'm like, how do you put this on? She goes, I don't know. We gotta get the kids to do it. Because the Cuban nowadays don't understand. I didn't grow up with a computer. I grew up with three channels. TV went off at midnight with a test pattern, came on the next day at 8 a.m. We had a rotary phone or a phone hung on a wall. We didn't have a computer on our phone. We actually carried on conversations with people instead of texting. And it's the, the technology, in my opinion, now I understand why some of these guys disappear into the woods and decide to start blowing up yeah. technology geeks. Oh, and no one can no one can communicate anymore. I mean if you go out for a me if you go out for a meal with the missus and you look around the restaurant, everyone's on their phones. There's no, one, no one talking. I go out to dinner with my wife, I don't take my phone. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, she's more attractive than this fucking phone. <laughs> and less irritating, and at least I'll get an intelligent response. Uh -huh. If you go out to dinner, I never take my phone. She takes hers, but I do not take my phone anymore. And to me, it's a distraction. It's disrespectful. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not perfect by all means, but I don't take my phone. I try to avoid that thing at all costs, and everybody knows it. If I don't recognize your number, you're not getting called back. If you're uh, not I like back, that. You have to wait. I like that. When we go out for, me and the missus go out for a meal, it's always like, phone down, keep it away in the pocket or, or whatever, or even leave it in the car because it's trying to be present. You know, you're trying to be present and in the moment. You don't need to be on social media all the time. The social media has ruined this country. I've never seen so many people who desire attention in my entire life as I see on social media. 63 years old. Why the fuck would I want to post a picture on myself and get a, a thousand likes? If somebody, oh, you look pretty good. I really don't care how I look. Look like a small troll. <laughs> on that on that note buddy i just want to i've heard you talk about before in terms of obviously there's a few things going on that you know much more about it than i do in terms of like the collective bargaining agreement and and things like that kind of you don't get a lot of access to your guys all of the time at certain parts of the season so my i'm guessing that you're, you've got quite a big component where you've got to educate your guys to, to do the right things you go to the maybe go to the right the right guys like how are you how are you going about that how are you educating them that look actually like this stuff that we do in this strength the strength work speed work is injury prevention work it's going to help you in the long run what are you doing to combat that uh first of all i think people don't understand the rules that nfl strength coaches have to exist under mm -hmm. 
end of the season until you start your voluntary off-season program, which is usually the third week of April. The dead zone, you can't touch them. They can come in and use your weight room. You can spot them, but you can't train them. You can send home voluntary programs, which they do not have to do. Uh, we only get two weeks to start an off-season program or two hours a day for two weeks. You just strength coaches, uh, strength and running, or energy system development. Then phase two, they're allowed on the field for an hour with their coaches. Uh, they're allowed on the field for an hour and 15 minutes with you and the rest of the time in a weight room. And let me tell you what, if you're doing a true acceleration speed session, I'm a firm believer. Your form up should progress from general to specific, and there should be a blurred line between the warm-up and the actual training session. There is a reason beyond elevating core temperature why we warm up. Increase muscle viscosity, prime the nervous system, increase nerve conduction velocity, and load warm up the muscle tendon complex. If I want to get my guy's core temperature increased, I live in Arizona. It's 107 degrees tomorrow. I'll just have him go stand outside for a minute. The core temperature will increase drastically. So then we go into OTA, which are on the field for two hours, meetings for an hour, and then in a weight room for an hour, because you're only allowed four hours in the building. And then there's another five-week dead zone where you can't touch it. You can send home a voluntary suggested program. You know, it's a rule of the third, Chris. Third of them will do it. Third of them will do some of it. Third of them won't do shit. And then you can write the camp. So there is a value for catapult and tracking because it allows you to gradiate the exposure to the stimulus. Yep. And after a day off, you're more likely to get injured because, again, you disrupt uh, the rhythm of stress and adaptation. I don't truly think people understand. In the NFL, you're training athletes from 22 to 42. If I'm 30 years old and I started playing the game of football at 12, that's 18 years of accumulated trauma. The general fan doesn't understand that. Right away, guys get injured. They want to point the finger at the strength coach. Why don't you point the finger at the player? Because they're 50 percent they're 50 percent responsible. What are they doing? What are they doing in the off season? Are they not doing anything until the day they show up? I can go down my roster right now and tell you guys who aren't doing shit, and they don't show up in crappy shape. Now you got to find a way. But part of it goes to the athletes too, like. Dan Pat said, they got him. James Smith asked Dan Pat this question once. What's your favorite athlete to train? He goes, one that's all in. And that's in James' book on the governing dynamics of uh, coaching. But people forget, the longer I play the sport, the more chance of injury I have likelihood of getting injured. Like I said, if you don't want to get injured, don't play the sport. If you don't want to get injured, don't train. Because if you truly train hard, at some point in time, you're going to get an ache or pain or a strain. I don't care who you are. Nobody goes through training without ever having an issue. But people don't understand. If I start playing at 12, every level, every year, the trauma, the force, the speed increases. The amount of – and it's a collision sport. Those collisions increase exponentially as I get older, as I get stronger. The biggest thing we have to teach rookies when they come here is, number one, the speed of the game. You could see a op whole open Christian. You're like, oh, it's a 15-yard gain. It times out to be a – Two yard loss because people recognize things. This is truly, when you talk about the process of obtaining sports mastery, the technical is underpinned by the technical, the technical is underpinned by the psychological, the psychological is underpinned by the physiological, physical, which allows the athletes to display, the, display those qualities with the skill on the field. You've got to be a PhD in your position. You've got to be able to recognize right away. Think about this. Think about how good Aaron Rodgers, Dan Marino, uh, Russell Wilson, I see Kyler do some things, and I'm like, how do you do that shit? You know, the ability to recognize, get rid of the ball, or make adjustments. You really got to be a PhD. But this is years and years of accumulated trauma on these guys' body. And we're not all the same. My ability to endure stress is, di is different than yours. And how you perceive stress is different than how I perceive stress. And it all depends on you know, my, my genotype, what's expressed in my genes, what I've been given. Uh, that, you know, Ralph Mann talks about the seven or eight performance limiting qualities all athletes possess. We control only one of them, and, and one of those is development. So he says, pick your parents. Yeah. I said, number, number two is your environment. What environment did you, did you grow up in? Were you always handed everything? Did your parents do everything for you? Were you a bunch of round of idiots? You know, who were more concerned about – I grew up in a family where – like I said, my parents were divorced. My mother uh, 
I've never seen my mother not go to work. She retired at the age of 83 after 43 years of being a bank teller and tried to go back the next day and get her job back. She's miserable being retired. But I never saw my mother miss a day of work. Uh, and that's the environment and that's the, that's the influences I've had. Uh, I tell people you know, all the time, I've been working since I was 12. I had a paper route, I caddied. When I turned 16 years of age, I got called to the office. And I was a pretty good kid. <laughs> You know, I, I, was, I wasn't that bad. And I'm like, what the fuck did I do? <laughs> they hand me this piece of paper and I said, take it home. I take this piece of paper home. This is on my 16th birthday. My wife, my, my mother grabs my hand, walks me two doors across the street to my friend's house and says to my, my best friend, George Murphy's father, Bud Murphy, he goes, here, put him to work. It was my work permit. The next day I was pumping gas in a boron gas station. <laughs> until 11, three days a week, plus on weekends. So I get off the activity bus from football, go down, go through the house, grab a sandwich if we had food, because we didn't have a lot of money, dress in my boron oil official gas pumping, gas attendant uniform, walk down the street to the streetcar, take a streetcar, get off right behind the gas station and pump gas. And I've never had a job where I worked in express or a clothing or a wreck. I was, it's always been manual labor. I've worked in a full mill, I've worked a roofing and a siding mechanic, uh, construction. I remember I worked in the steel mill, the Clarton Steelworks, and my mother remarried to my stepfather on his own construction company. And for two weeks in the month of July, all the college kids would be laid off because they were cleaning the mill. I worked in a rolling mill. So yeah, I go out on a Sunday night, I'm like, oh, great, I got two weeks off. I'm just going to, I'm like, I'm not going to do shit. So I hear my mother walk up the steps. I'm like, now what? She pink, uh, pokes her head around the doorway. She goes, get up, you're going to work with Adolf, who at the time was just my mother's boyfriend. Walks about halfway down the steps. I hear her come back up. She pokes her head around the doorway and says, and don't you fucking embarrass me. So for <laughs> weeks, I'm shoveling concrete from a guy that became my stepfather. And trust me, Chris, he didn't take it easy on me. The first day I went with his son, I'm like, oh, I'm with his son, Victor. We're going to ride a dump truck all day and do nothing. We go out to this mill in Carnegie, PA. There's a ditch. It's got to be five feet deep, three feet wide, and runs 100 yards. There's a backhoe. I'm like, oh, Victor will throw up with a backhoe. I'll just pat it with a shovel. He puts two shovels in there. He's still in a ditch. I'm like, what? There's going to be 20 hours still in the ditch. There was no hydration. There were no water breaks. There was no use in the payloader right there. He just shoveled dirt for eight straight hours. He came back at 4.30 and took me home. I think I just walked into the house, mumbled something to my mother, and went right upstairs and went to bed. I couldn't get wait to get back in the mill. But if you think about it, all she was doing was teaching me to work. That's all it was. And that's, how I, that's the environment I was raised in. So I think a lot of things, you know, genetics loads a gun, environment pulls the trigger. Mm -hmm. What's the environment? What's your support system? Um, you know, I've always been surrounded by great coaches from high school all the way up to the coaches I've met throughout my coaching career who have, still have a great influence on me. I still call Anthony and Milo, uh, Bowie, uh, Aaron Wellman, some of these guys that, listen, I don't have all the answers. I know what I know. I always tell my wife, I don't know a lot, but I know what I know. And if I don't know it, I'll find it. Mm -hmm. Why my desk looks like it does. You know, Einstein, Einstein said, and he's a smarter man than I'll ever be if a, if a Cluttered desk is a sign of a cluttered mind. What does empty desk is a sign of? I'll give you a hint. How about empty? <laughs> so I think it's important. There, there's no way you can tell me during the course of a day you can't read 10 pages. I didn't go to the Evelyn Wood speed reading course. Sometimes I got to read one page 10 times, which I never tell people. But I try to read at least 10 pages a day. And I'll go back and reread things. So I have a bunch of books in my office. And people say, have you read all those books? I'll say, no. I've read some of all of them, and I'll go back and reread them. Uh, you can my desk now. Super Training is on there. Uh, Shirley Sharman's book on movement dysfunctions is on there. Uh, I'm reading rereading James Smith's book on applied sprint training. Yeah, and right. an old book that I don't even know if you can find anymore. Milo asked me to send him a copy. But remember D.B. Hammer, Dietrich uh -huh. Bolchoff, uh -huh. best book training book ever. I'm reading that again because you never know when you go back. And you think, oh, yeah, that's right. It'll spark something. And I think I don't care who you are. If you can write a program and look at yourself and pat yourself on the back, God bless you. 
I look at programs I write, I wrote a month ago, and I face palm myself. Like, what the fuck were you thinking? You know, and I, I think that's just, you have to be your biggest critic. Mm -hmm. But you have to also control yourself from outthinking yourself. So if I have an idea, I'll text Mila. If I have an idea, I'll text Anthony. I'll get thoughts. What are your thoughts? Let me know. Um, you know, I read, I, I, I talk to Gadango about his stuff. I read my wife's son, Fred's stuff. He puts out some great stuff. Because you read this stuff and you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. I knew that. But sometimes you need to have a memory spark. Yep. Because there's so much going on in your head. I think, I don't know, who, my wife has on her phone, somebody called me a, a borderline autistic. Yeah, that's, I, I truly am. Because this is the only thing I do. I can't tell you about world politics. I can't tell you about the virus that we have now, which I think is bogus. I can't tell you about a lot of things, Chris, because I'm consumed with trying to make my guys better and trying to make myself better as a coach. Mm -hmm. We want our guys to get better. What are you doing as a coach to make yourself better? Are you truly reading every day? Are you truly continuing to educate? Or have you just learned one system, stay with that system, think it's the end all to be all, and just surround yourself with a bunch of little idiots who are just going to regurgitate everything that comes out of your mouth and not challenge anything you say or do. And I think that's a mistake because you get no better, you get complacent, and the goal is for everybody to get better every day so that's how i approach my system that's how i approach my training i don't get me wrong i think there's some great people on instagram uh strong by science max marzo and his crew do a great job yep. of athletic movement assessment these guys up in canada mm -hmm. i don't believe in a functional movement screen the minute that thing came out i said it was bogus um and i said it was bogus because you're telling me you can prevent injury you can't yeah not so, telling somebody they can't train because they have a poor fms score like telling somebody you can't lift weights because you're not strong enough. You know, yep. <laughs> like, don't even get me on. I'm not, I'm going to avoid this ranting on training in sand and pulling out a foot ladder. <laughs> oh, nonsense. I, I'll spare you those rants. Uh, but it's the same thing is I, I agree with an assessment, uh, but I, I also understand that that's normal for him. I'm really tired of the dorsiflexion issue. I think I, it's time to move on. Time to move on from that stuff. Time to move, just like years ago, first it was the T8, remember the transverse abdominis? Mm -hmm. Multipity. Then it's the psoas. Then it's the BMO. Then it's the glute med minute. It's a new flavor of the month, a new month of the month. Every month it's dysfunctional. If we're just so dysfunctional as human beings, how the fuck are we moving? <laughs> I love when people used to say, he has gluteal amnesia. Good. I'm just like, what? I just <laughs> take a shit. My glutes must be firing. You know, so I think people, again, PTs have become obsessed and lost their mind over movement. Mm -hmm. I believe there are optimal movement patterns. I believe giving somebody a task is going to be solved differently from everybody. You want to know who you walk like? You walk like your parents. Because your parents are the first people you see growing up and the first people you start to imitate. And what you, because as a child, you're an imitator. I walk like my mother. I waddle like a penguin with no knees. My knees do not bend. I don't care. I love when people say, why don't you let me try this on you? I can fix you. I'm like, man, listen, you can't fix me. So don't, don't hit me with, I can fix you, bit. I'm pretty good right now. I'm 63. I'm still training. I know my limits. A couple of weeks ago, though, I got a little arrogant and cocky, Chris. I was over to Charles Bentley's place. He's one of the very few places open. And uh, I've been blessed to have a great friendship with the Charles. And he let me come over there and lift. And I got off cocky one day and I grabbed the 80 pound dumbbells, did 10 reps for on a dumbbell incline. I couldn't move my shoulders for like eight days after. <laughs> so, you know, I know my limits. That's why you can make a fun all the all you want of the Smith machine. When you get to be my age, that Smith machine is the greatest tool to press off you can only imagine. Becomes well, your best friend. <laughs> I love this. I'm going nuts without a Smith machine. I told my wife, I said, I'm going to buy a Smith machine and put it in the garage. She goes, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not on the motorcycle in there. You're not even allowed in there. But if I, if I could take a Smith machine and put it in the backyard next to the pool and put a tarp over it, I'm, but it has to be pretty cheap. But yeah, at my age, a Smith machine is a great, valuable tool. Everything's a tool at the end of the day, you know? Yeah, everything is useful. Mm -hmm. Everything can be used if it's 
again, if it strengthens the extensors of the arms in a scapper plane, who cares? Yep. You know, think about it. an offensive lineman, a benefit is they have long arms. But for a bench press, it's a horrible benefit. It's a, it's a disadvantage. Some of these guys, you know, it's advantageous for their sport. Doesn't mean it's advantageous in the weight room. Mm-hmm. You better pick the low-hanging fruit that's the easiest for them to do, and they can't screw up. You know, even we write programs now, and I have to take into account multiple different scenarios. Maybe this guy has a weight room. Uh, maybe this guy's in a PT clinic. Brett Fisher has a great PT clinic out here. We have a weight room where guys can join. They go there and train. Maybe he doesn't, so now it's going to be all body weight exercises. Uh, maybe he just has bands. And again, a push-up is not just a push-up. There's multiple variations of a push-up. Eccentric, rap, or slow eccentrics, the isometrics, rapid eccentrics, isometrics, uh, eccentrics only, isodynamic work. You know, go down and hold the bottom position for five seconds or six seconds, do a rep. Go down and hold for five seconds. And de- decrease the amount of time as fatigue sets in. Um, there's multiple ways you can have people manual resistance. You can do it with bands. You can do it incline. You can do a decline. You can do staggered stands. You can do yoga push-ups, Hindu push-ups. You can do ISO yielding. I can do ISO overcoming. There's multiple methods to use to challenge the push-up beyond just doing 8 million reps a day and trying to get more and more reps. Mm-hmm. You can do rest pause. You can do clusters. I'm going to do eight push-ups, rest 30 seconds, can drop it down and on. There's multiple different variations that you can use to make that push-up harder. You just got to think. Problem is, nobody wants to think. They all want a cookie-cutter answer. And they want to end all the be all answer to everything doesn't exist until there's one perfect individual not going to exist. 100%. Um, just, I'm getting wary of the time here, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I just, my final question here is, just, I gave what, out my nap time for this. I want you to know. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> where do you, uh, where do you see like the future of S and S and C going? And I know obviously, James Smith's governing dynamics gives a bit of a, an insight potentially into that um, with kind of the SNC position potentially coming kind of obsolete. What, what, what do you feel about that? And kind of with your experience in the field, where do you see it going? Um, that, that's, that's a tough question, Chris. I think everybody should buy James's book. Mm-hmm. Honestly. Uh, and I'm not saying that because James gives me a kickback or James is a good friend. I just think he's among the most, intelligent man I've ever met in my life. I know how he talks, so sometimes you gotta get through the verbiage. And I'm like, James, instead of using that fucking word, you could have said it this way. But I understand because I've been around you for so long and I have the ultimate respect. I consider him a good friend. Unfortunately, and I really hate to say this, Chris, is our profession has become a circus act. Mm -hmm. It's become hype men. I'm waiting for some guy to jump through a flaming hoop from a 12 foot drop with 100 pounds on his back to fire up his team. Breaking boards over each other's backs, going outside when it's 40 degrees below, there's a 100 mile an hour wind, there's a chill that's like a Canadian Arctic cold, and you're out there in a t shirt to show how tough you are. It's just fucking stupid. Um, I just, you know, too much cheerleading, mm-hmm. too much volume of work. Too much grinding athletes in the ground, and the only reason you're getting away with this is young kids. But I also understand this. It's being perpetuated, and I may never get a job after this, by the majority of head coaches. Because they want to see these guys ground in the ground, make them tougher, break them. I want to say, I work for a head coach, I'm not going to say where, he wanted trash cans all around the way. They should be vomiting every day. Like, what the fuck kind of attitude is that, you jackass? That's why you got fired after I left and came to Arizona. True training is as much a science as it is an art. We've all talked about that. I think the only difference that exists, and like I said, I don't know it all. I know the extensiveness of what I don't know, so I'm always reading. Mm-hmm. I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface as far as the body's concerned. Uh, look at Peter Whalen and Ken Clark's research on single leg speed hops producing one and a half two times greater force and landing on one leg sprinting um and when the body the brain and the nervous system figure that out you have people running at 35 miles an hour as i said before that you're saying both 27.8 you gotta ask yourself how many times are you saying bolt run that time one time on the optimal conditions environment when uh, readiness meets met preparation 
Um, but I, I, I'm I'm kind of disappointed in the avenue it's taken. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, as long as somebody gives me a job, I will coach. I'll be like my mother and not retire. I can't see a day not going into the weight room, not being on the field. I'm not a personal trainer. I don't want to own my own performance center. I don't like people in general. So I'm not going to put up with parents. I did that before and just, again, I was eating well butrin like it was M&M's. I would hope that um, the strength and conditioning profession straightens it out. Mm -hmm. I don't think the answer is to have everybody certified. Uh, just because you're certified doesn't tell me shit. Can you coach on the floor? I know a lot of intelligent people, you put them on the floor, they're going to get their ass kicked. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of guys who are certified and have put people in a hospital for randomylosis of athletes, unfortunately, pass away. So certification is not the end all to be all answer. I think it comes down to continuing education on your part as a, as a coach. Uh, I think the only thing that separates me, I always tell people, I'm like farmer's insurance. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. And that's 40 years of doing this, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I, I don't think you could say enough for experience, to be honest. Yep. Experience of, you know, there's situations that are going to arise. You've got to make quick decisions. Mondays after games, I'm constantly communicating with our trainers. Who's injured? Who can do what? Who can't do what? This this recovery protocol works for this guy. It doesn't work for that guy. So fitting guys into the proper recovery protocols, understanding that on this level, these guys don't start recovering until Wednesday. I mean, they get to me, the human body is about one thing, and it's energy. When you're in season, spring ball, OTAs, tactically, technically, and psychologically, you're expending all your energy. How much energy do you think you really got left to hammer in the weight room? Yeah. All you're doing is going to tap into those abilities of the human body to recover. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm -hmm. I, it's probably not some people, we're lifting heavy during the season. We're going to get stronger. I'm like, fuck, good luck. Let me see those movement patterns. Let me see how horrible they look. You know, you, you can't tell me. It, it's just impossible. To, in my opinion, it's impossible. That's why most of our work is James Smith has always expressed You'll get more out of submaximal work than you want to get out of maximal. There's a time and place for everything, like the song says. And the time and place is not during the season when they're already beat up. And think about this. In the NFL, that's the longest period of time I get to be with them. It's one of the most beat up. When the technical, technical, psychological aspects of the, the game and the sporting activity of the process of attaining sports mastery is taking precedent. You have to understand all loads. I look at what our massage therapists do, and this show I'm asking our, our our massage people to keep a note on guys they work on because it's, it's a stressor to the tissue. Mm -hmm. Think about this. It's, a, it's still a load. Rolfing, gas, uh, Graston, uh, Shizatu massage, Swedish massage, all the tools they use, cupping, uh, lacrosse balls, foam rollers. The common denominator amongst all of them is just pressure and release, is it not? Yeah. Well, pressure to the tissue still has to be accounted for. So, like James Smith says, in the dynamics of uh, governing, it has to take, be taken into account. The physiotherapy has to be taken into account, along with loading on the field, in games, stress of travel. And Dan always talks about, you know, different lifestyle folders, like different KPI folders. What's your lifestyle fold? What's your sleep hygiene? How's your hydration? How's your nutrition? What other stressors are you incurring outside the sporting activity with your family, your wife, your kids that have to be accounted for? Stress is stress. Once that cup overflows, I got news for you. That fucker ain't going shorter. Yep. <laughs> you know, so I think it's just the point a lot of things that people are, are talking about. But I think as strength coaches, we got to be skeptical. I mean, I'm skeptical of the programs I write. I get to the point where I got to tell Evan and Mark after I've asked them to look over them, send it out now or I'm just going to keep redoing it. And I'll do that to myself. I'll tell Evan because I'm not a computer guy. Everybody knows that. When Anthony left, he, I stole Evan louder off him. I said, and Anthony's word, uh, phrase, a uh, uh, comment to Ed was, take care of him. <laughs> no good on the computer. <laughs> so, and, you know, I'm so focused on what I'm doing training wise with my guys mm -hmm. and collecting force plates and looking at force plate metrics and looking at uh, the Nord board, which I don't think strength has anything to do with muscle pulls. It just gives us an indication. 
I think the true indication is have they been exposed to high velocity work? And yeah. number two, what's their level of tolerance? Has their level of tolerance exceeded what they trained for? I mean, has their capacity exceeded, or the work exceeded the tolerance level? Then you're into no man's land. Mm -hmm. uh, you get modified. Just because somebody's medically cleared does not mean their performance cleared. There's a gap. So I'm always filling that gap when somebody comes back from injury. And I work very closely with our trainers. And I can't say enough for Tom Reed and Chad Cook and Jeff Hurden and David Hines and Brett Fisher because we work so closely together that there's, you know, I got to fill in gaps. Yeah. Just when the coaches have them on field for an hour, I got to fill in gaps of what wasn't done. You know, from a technical and tactical standpoint, I'm not a big believer in change of direction. I think it's a waste of time. I think it's mind numbing. I think it's pattern program and predicted. I think it serves a purpose early just to expose the tissues those joint structures to those movements, but it's not true agility. Uh, I don't do very much of it. You look at what Mike Cadango works with the McCourty brothers and some of the best athletes in the NFL, and guess what? Chris Hogan doesn't squat. They don't do change of direction drills. If they all, it enables them to do what they do. That's your job. Mm -hmm. Enable them to do what they do. Understand what we do is a small part of it. Just one spoke in the will. They've got to be a PhD in their position, and their sport, and we're not sport coaches. And part of that, again, like Dan, meet them 50-50. They have to meet us 50-50. So there's so many things to be considered. I think people just think, Frank Coach, you're just meatheads, and it's easy to write a fucking program. Yeah. Understand this. Like I said, acute, immediate, cumulative, delayed, and residual effects of training. You have to take that all into account. I wrote a program for the next two weeks. Where are they going to be four weeks from now? Where's my plan? And if you have multiple training objectives, multiple motor abilities, there's only one way to go, in my opinion. James has talked about everybody's vertical integration. Mm -hmm. Because all those elements or components are present at all times. It's just varying the amount of volume and what's being emphasized. We're not block periodization. Block periodization is great for somebody who has minimal training objectives. In the sport of American football, we don't. And you have, like I said, a hierarchy of qualities that Ryan Williams and I wrote about in our book. That we wrote back in 2011, it'll give you those hierarchy of physical qualities based on position. And those need, those need to be followed. Maximal strength is important for offensive linemen. It's not important for DBs and skill guys. It's not important for kickers. <clears throat> so you've got to look at age. And there's so many factors that, you know, I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning sometimes. 3 o'clock in the morning, yeah, I get up to pee 12 times a night, which you'll do when you get to age because your prostate doesn't really cooperate with you. Um, but right away your mind goes to, oh, this guy got this going on. How can I make this better? Or how can I solve this issue? <clears throat> Love Cal Deeds, but you're not going to do French contrast with guys in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Especially they're not prepared for it because yeah. they spend too much time away from you. Yeah. And you have to put things back in place. Just like proper speed mechanics. Warren Landau talks about this in the Denver Broncos become a good friend of mine. you got to go back to the basics of these guys because there's too much of a break. There's too much of a break that they're giving off. Injuries, the development of sporting skill all take precedent where the basics, even though you're trying to maintain them in the warm-up, you only get a 10-minute warm-up and it's hard to do. Yeah. So there's a lot to be considered. We're not, as, uh, we're not meatheads like everybody thinks. I, I think uh, most strength coaches are very intelligent men. You have to understand have a working understanding of, you know, functional anatomy, which Eric Cressy and Mike Robertson, Mike Reinhold, and those guys do a tremendous, Tony Gentical, those guys do a tremendous job. Mm -hmm. Again, young coaches I respect and follow. But you can never get to the point where you think you sit on the throne and know everything. I don't want to be the guru. I don't want to be it. Because, like I said before, <clears throat> when shit hits the fan, things go bad. You better be prepared to take responsibility for that. Just like you take responsibility for your guys winning all the time. For sure. And I think, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great point to, to kind of wrap it up on there, buddy. I know I don't want to take too much more of your time. Just, just finally here, um, one piece of advice that you'd give to any, any young coaches. I know you, you pretty much nailed a few um, just then. One piece of advice that you maybe give to a young coach that are trying to get into or just coming out of maybe school. Be skeptical of everything. Mm -hmm. Love a great critical thinking process just because the latest guru says it does not mean it's right. Uh, understand words like dysfunction, sports specific, 
and you can't train specific to you will never be able to create create the biomechanical neurophysiological rate of force development rate coding in the nervous system that occurs on the field in a weight room if we could do that why practice yeah. understand uh people are creating terms to sell their product uh, so critical thinking uh, be skeptical of everything, including yourself. Find a great mentor who's always learning. And I mean, nowadays you have to network, which has been a mistake that I haven't done uh, my whole career. Uh, but find people who you trust. Find the best. Talk to the best. Develop a relationship with people like Dan Papp or Charlie. And unfortunately, Charlie's gone. People like Louis Simmons. Get their insight and then be able to adjust mm -hmm. and apply it to your sport and understand your sport, understand the positions at your sport. Go sit in an offensive line meeting. Go sit in a tight end meeting. Our tight end coach in Arizona, Steve Hyde, I coached Steve and gave him his nickname Stumpy when he was a Cleveland. <laughs> Sometimes I'll sit in his tight end and sit in the back room of tight end so I can understand what they're at, what they're asked to do. Understand their kinematic uh, uh, sequencing, understand what they're asked to do, understand the positions they're asked to be in, uh, and, and constantly read and educate yourself and understand, man, I'm never going to know it all. I'm never going to write the Holy Grail, but there's no reason I can't chase it. And I think that's what's uh, the fun part about my profession. That's why I still have a tremendous passion for it. Uh, there's days I go in a weight room and I'm like any human being. I'm dog tired. My wife has to kick me out of the bed in the morning and say, get up. You got to go. And, uh, you know, once you get in the weight room and the lights go on and the music comes on, all of a sudden you find this energy like, this is where I want to be. This is the greatest fucking job in the world. I don't have to brush my teeth. I don't have to shave any day. These guys don't feel a fuck if I shower or put deodorant on. All they care about is do I care enough about them to help them make better and enable them to do what they want to do. And I think that's true coaching. And, again, you can be cert certification. Don't tell me shit. Now they tell me I haven't been certified in 40 years. Now they tell me I got to be certified. I'm like, I got to dummy myself down. <laughs> See you guys in the NSDA talking about ESCCA, about force plate reading. I still tell you, so you're telling people you need to increase stride length and stride length uh, frequency to run faster. I don't see, you're still telling people to do 300 yard shuttles. Nope. So you're telling me I got to be certified? <laughs> But you guys change the stuff too. You want to learn about speed? Go to a track, great track coach. You want to learn about strength? Go to Lee Simmons. But understand what they do and what I'm going to do is different. I argue with Louie all the time. Uh, when I stayed with him, I said, okay, Lou, we got to go to, we got to go to track. For what? So we got to do speed work. We got to do acceleration work. Hey, now you got stronger. But doesn't transfer. Lou. Doesn't. I said, I guarantee you, you take five of your top lifters who have the strongest hamstrings and we run some 15 20 yard sprints i guarantee you half of them pull hamstring because have they not been they may be strong but they haven't been exposed to that type of stress or tissue yep so i guarantee and plus they have shorable mechanics because <laughs> they're gonna open they're gonna overcast they're gonna fatigue real easy so you know there's a, i think there's a lot of be a lot of respect amongst professions but you know we're all in the same boat nobody's doing anything secret Mm -hmm. So let's stop acting like we have the end all to be all answers. Uh, let's understand that I'm winning because we're recruiting the best athletes. And there's sometimes, yeah, we're going to get athletes that are not five star recruits that come up and turn out to be great players in the NFL. We had a kid, Jabal Sheard, who's now been in the league for nine years. I coached Jabal in college. He was a leftover recruit from Florida. Now he's been nine years in the league and has, a super, I think, two Super Bowl rings for the. When he was at the New England Patriots. So there's late bloomers, there's early bloomers, there's no predictor. You don't know what you get until they show up. And then once they show up, can I make them better? Or are they that good that I just can't, don't fuck them up? And I, uh, I think that is a, that's a brilliant point actually to, to, to finish on. Almost sometimes it's better just, just to get out of their way and let them do their thing, you know? Yep. Absolutely. I don't uh, coach. If I coached Curtis Martin in college, I didn't make Curtis Martin what he is. He would do things I'd just look at and just shake my head. I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> no, it wasn't me. That was a guy upstairs and his, his parents were picked properly. 
Well, there you go. There you go. All right, buddy. Look, I won't, I won't take any more of your time, but I really appreciate you coming on today. And then you can get back to your afternoon nap. I'm beyond that now. I'm going to have a glass of wine. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, buddy. Really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Best of luck. Give Ryan Horn my best. Will do. Thank you. Thank you.